This audio lesson is being brought to you by the Tanakh Talk Network. Visit OutreachJudaism.org to purchase Rabbi Tovia Singer's Let's Get Biblical Books and other learning products. Now to our lesson by Rabbi Tovia Singer. In the United States alone, there are 469 missions just to the Jewish people. Evangelical missions that are specifically targeting the Jewish community for conversion. Last year, more than $170 million was spent on Jewish evangelism. We have now approaching 200 Messianic congregations just in the United States alone. What is their message? What is the message of the Gospel? What are these Christians telling us? They are saying to you, that we want you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We want you to believe in the Christian Messiah, because by believing in the Messiah, you are saved. And if you don't believe in Jesus, you're damned, you're lost, all eternity. This statement of theology, very clear, very simple theology, is articulated numerous times in the Christian scriptures. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, the New Testament says very clearly, if you believeth and you're baptized, you're saved, and if you believeth not, you're damned. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, very vividly describes the eternal lake of fire that awaits those who do not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. John chapter 15 verse 6 describes those who reject Jesus. They are like bundles of wood and men take them and roll them together and cast them afire. It's very clear. Christians want us to believe that God's salvation program is hinged on if you believe you're saved and if you don't believe, if you do not accept the Messiah, you're going to hell. You can be a nice person, but if you reject Jesus, there is no salvation for you. John 14, 6, Jesus says very clearly, you cannot come to the Father except through me. Very, very clear. Salvation is only through the Lamb of God. Naturally, That's a very, very large statement. And it has a thundering sound to it. We certainly want to do the right thing. Because we're being told that that's God's whole salvation program. When it all comes down to it, that's what it comes down to. Before Eichmann was hanged in Israel, two days before he was hanged, he requested a confessor. And they flew in a Dutch confessor. Dutch minister, and Eichmann then confessed his sins and accepted Jesus. According to Christian theology, if he, if he accepted Jesus sincerely, he went to heaven. And the Jews who he murdered didn't accept Jesus, they're in hell. We want to ask ourselves this question. The question is, if indeed God's entire salvation program basically all comes down to that, if you believe, you're saved, and if you don't believe, you're going to hell, and there is no salvation without grace through Jesus, well, we certainly want to look at the Jewish scriptures. You know, when we say the Jewish scriptures, that's an impressive statement. The Jewish scriptures, in terms of physical size, is quite large. It's more than 30,000 verses. The question is, how many times in the Jewish scriptures does it say that when the Messiah comes, if indeed what God really wants from us, more than anything else, is to accept Jesus, the question becomes, 
How many times in the Jewish scriptures does it say that when the Messiah comes, you should believe in him and you should accept him as the Messiah? Remember, everything from eating cockroaches to cross-dressing, and when you go out to the army, bring utensils so you can take care of your bathroom needs. The, the greatest detail is covered in the Everything you can imagine is there. How many times do we find the Bible saying this is the whole salvation program of God and God is not a man that he should change his mind. He's not a mortal that he should repent. Numbers, right, 23 verse 19. Doesn't change. The flowers can fade, right? The grass can wither, but the word of the Lord stands forever and ever. So if God's salvation program stands forever and ever. The question is, how many times in the Jewish scriptures does God tell us that when the Messiah comes, the most important myths of all, we are told. How many times are we instructed that when the Messiah comes, we should accept him? And does anyone know what the answer is? Zero. The Bible never, the Jewish scriptures never says that when the Messiah comes, you should accept him. Not one time. The question is why? If that is the most important thing to God... That means we're talking about God's salvation program. Why doesn't it at least one time say, when the Messiah comes, you should believe in him? It should, if that's real. Because remember, Christians are not saying that the New Testament is a different God than the Old Testament. They're saying that the, that the New Testament simply dovetails with the Old. It's the same God. The same God that moved the hand of Jeremiah, Lahavdil moved the hand of Paul. Well, that's the case. But we have to ask ourselves the question, if it's the same Creator, the same Father, the same Jehovah, then we have to ask the question, why doesn't it even say at one time anywhere in the Jewish Scriptures that when the Messiah comes, you should accept Him? It should certainly, I mean, we find the prohibition of eating Leaven on Passover is a number of times mentioned in the Jewish scriptures. The prohibition of eating cockroaches and insects and the like mentioned a number of times. If someone takes a, a cockroach and eats it, well, you first will have to have your head checked. But besides that, <laughs> but besides that, right? Besides that, there are not just once, but many times the Bible warns us about such things. The prohibition against into marriage, not once, many times. Oh, the prohibition of idolatry. Hoo-hoo! Those are the things that certainly can put someone's soul in great jeopardy. Many times. Not a prophet went silent on that subject. Yet the one thing that Christians tell us is God's salvation program. That's it. Not even one time in the Jewish group. Now, we know why. But I want to ask you a second question. Of course, it has nothing to do with God's salvation program. But I want to ask you another question. Why is it not there according to classical Judaism? Think about this for a moment. We as Jews believe one of the fundamental principles of Judaism, according to Maimonides and his list of the things that we believe, right? We believe in the coming of the Messiah. That's very important. When a person dies and they go upstairs, one of the things our sages tell us that will be asked of us is, see peace of Yeshua. Did we await for the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the coming of the Messiah, for the salvation? Did we believe that this was going to happen? So the question is, according to Judaism, according to classical Judaism, the question is really, why doesn't it say it according to us? It should have said somewhere, According to Judaism, you know, the Messiah is going to come with this man of King of David will come, and when he comes, embrace him, don't reject him. It should say that even according to Judaism. Why doesn't it say it there? We understand very well why it doesn't say it according to Christianity, but why not according to Judaism? Can anyone answer that question? Anyone want to answer that question? Why is it according to Judaism doesn't it say it even once? should say it. You know, when Mashiach comes, you should accept him. Yes? Okay, I, I'm going to really, really go out on a real big, I don't know what they call it, and, and 
assume what you really mean is that we're not supposed to believe in people, we're only supposed to believe in God. Is that what you mean? Right, obviously, the oneness of God. So what his answer is, the reason why he doesn't say it is, because it shouldn't say you should believe in the Messiah, you only believe in God. But that's not entirely correct. First of all, what I'm asking is, it shouldn't say, obviously, believe in the Messiah. It's very clear that the Messiah is not to be God, he's to fear God, Isaiah 11, verse 2 and 3. Very clear. But we, for instance, have precedent for God saying, men who represent me accept them and don't reject them, and if you do, I will require it of you. Of course, that's Deuteronomy 18. He says, I will raise unto you prophet, will be like Moses, and right, and so on. And once he has passed the tests of Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18, he says, if you don't listen to the words of that prophet, I'm going to require it of you. So why doesn't it say also, so we have precedent, that when the Mashiach comes, you should accept him. You shouldn't reject him. Bob? Everybody will know who he is. Oh, Bob just said the whole thing. Because the answer is, it would be like the Bible saying that you should believe. Lift your right hand and look at it and say, I believe that you are my right hand. Put you in a straitjacket, right? When the Mashiach comes, the one thing we know about messianic prophecy, as we will examine in one moment, is that when the real Messiah comes, all you're going to do is go look out the window, and you're going to know the Messiah is here. It will require no faith whatsoever. The whole world will know. Uh, Jeremiah 31, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, you will not have to teach them about God, for they will know me. And the knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea, Isaiah 11. What I'd like to do is ask you, let's take a look at the classical messianic prophecies that all Jews and, Greek, and Christians agree are messianic. Let's go. Give them. Throw them up. Give me some messianic prophecies, the classical prophecies, and we're going to examine something. Go ahead. Okay. Bob just said... Swords into plowshares, that of course comes from Isaiah chapter 2, and I'm going to call that universal peace on earth. And he shall rebuke many nations. And what are the nations going to do as a result? They're going to convert, stop converting Jews, but instead they're going to convert their implements of war into implements of agriculture. They'll take their swords into plowshares. The Loisa Goyal Goy Cherv nation shall not lift up sword against this nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. Oh, in Isaiah chapter 11, the lamb will lie with the lion. Oh my, and the little baby, little baby in the cobra's den. Universal peace on earth. That's one. Let's go another one. Yes. Let's change that slightly to there'll be a universal knowledge of God, which we mentioned a moment ago. That means that the whole world We'll know about the one God, and we sing it in shul, right? They sang it already once, right? The Ne'emar, the Hoyo Hashem, the Melech Al Kala Oretz. Right? Jews always think that's a signal to fold up your talus. I always tell them it's not true. <laughs> it's not true at all. That's not a signal. Oh, there it is, Shirley. You have the keys, I have the keys. Yo, let's go. Oh, that's the tune. It's time to go. No, that's not it at all. Oh, that Zechariah 14, what's going to happen at the end of days? That God, oh, he's going to be king of the whole universe. His name will be one. He will be one. Very clear. Give me another messianic prophecy. Yes. The resurrection of the dead. Very clear messianic prophecy. There are many, many places in Tanakh which deal with the resurrection of the dead. Predominantly, we have three of them. It's Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. There are many sleeping in the earth will rise, some for everlasting blessing, and others for everlasting contempt and derision. But we have Isaiah 26, 19. We have Ezekiel 37, 14 and 15. Magnificent verses. Give me another one. Don't all jump at the same time. Calm down, relax, be respectful. Give me another one. You're a lot of cheat too, okay? So now raise your hand. Yes. The building of the final temple, Isaiah 40, excuse me, Ezekiel 43, verse 7, that will stand forever and ever. Very clear in Ezekiel 37 as well. The final temple will be built. What else? 
The ingathering of the exiles, and to the north, I will say, give forth, and to the south, do not hold back. Oh, the nation of Israel is going to return to the land of Israel where it belongs. What else? That's sort of part of, I would say that's a subset of the universal knowledge of God. They're going to all accept one God. That's very good. Um, Zechariah 14, 16. Right, very good. Wings of an eagle. It just That's talking about the ingathering. That's how God, it's a subset of that. How about, someone said Elijah, the coming of Elijah the prophet before the great, that's sort of what brings about the messianic age. Before the Messiah comes, and I want to ask you a question. What do these messianic prophecies have in common? Now, they don't have this in common with all prophecies in the Bible, but there is something unique about messianic prophecies. There's a certain quality to them that is unique. What is that quality about messianic prophecies? Yes? They don't mention the Messiah at all. No. What is unique about the messianic prophecies? The answer is, it's called, they are exhaustive and exclusive. That's the term that's often used, which means that when they occur, you will know it. It will require no faith whatsoever. When your great-grandmother comes walking down the street, time to pack, time to go. There's no other way to interpret that experience. It's time, right? It's time. Call Ella. Hello, it's time. One-way ticket, right? The one quality of messianic prophecies is that when they occur, there'll be no question about what's happening. How is the universal knowledge of God going to occur? Because they're going to put our brains and we're going to become programmed? No! It'll be so obvious to the world. We'll look out our window. We're going to open the front page of the New York Times. Instead of seeing the treachery of Bosnia and Oklahoma City, it's going to be world peace. There can be no way to interpret that experience except to know the Mashiach is here. And the problem is, Jesus didn't fulfill even one of these prophecies. That's why we don't believe in him. That's the predominant reason. We're going to find others. The predominant reason is he, there is no relationship between what the Bible has to say about the Messiah and what Christians call their Messiah. We can pronounce the word the same way, we can spell it the same way, but it is two entirely different concepts. There is no relationship between them. How would a Christian respond to that, by the way? What would a Christian say? He didn't fulfill any of these prophecies. How could he be the Messiah? What would they respond? What they would say is, ha ha, don't worry. Second coming, he's going to come a second time. And then he will fulfill these messianic prophecies. So then I'm too eligible to be the Messiah. Just you have to wait the second time. The problem is, of course, how many times in the Bible does it say that the Messiah is going to come twice? How many times do we find that the Bible tells them that's a rather significant piece of information? Remember, there are hundreds of messianic verses, so we should have a large body of messianic literature to choose from. How many times do we find in the Jewish scriptures that it says that the Messiah is going to come twice? And the answer is zero, not one time. Isn't that odd? Let's take it even further. Christians will say to you, wait, wait. You don't understand. Jesus didn't go without fulfilling anything. He fulfilled many, many messianic prophecies at all. Right? He fulfilled 100, 180, 240, 360. Do we have 400? He fulfilled many. You can look at different books. Each one has a different... He fulfilled numerous, numerous prophecies. And we've looked at many of them. He was born of a virgin. Didn't you see that? And not only that, he was a resident of Nazareth. Matthew 2, 23. What a wonderful fulfillment of messianic prophecies. And we're not going to deal with the legitimacy of those prophecies. So what they'll say is you have to understand. I want you to listen very carefully. It's not that Jesus didn't fulfill any prophecies. There are some prophecies that he has fulfilled. And there are many prophecies that he will fulfill in the future in his second coming. So basically we have two categories. And we can set them up as two Two different places. We'll put it over here. This is category number one. And these are the prophecies that he's filled already. And we'll walk away from that and go to category number two. And these are the prophecies that he has not fulfilled yet, but will fulfill in the second coming. 
Now listen with all your brains very carefully to every word. Watch this. Is it just a coincidence? Is it just a coincidence that all the prophecies that Jesus allegedly fulfilled, and we will not go through the legitimacy of them now, we'll just leave them there. That's this group right here, group A. Isn't it interesting that the one thing they all have in common is they are not exhaustive and exclusive, and the one quality about the section B, those that he has not fulfilled yet, which we have, which we have just articulated, he he, he will fulfill, but he has not fulfilled yet. Is that just an accident? Take, he was born, he lived in Nazareth. He was a resident of Nazareth. Just take that. Do you have his passport? Do you have his driver's license? That means there's no way for us to know. He was born of a virgin. Is there any way that we can know today? No, there'll be no way. But if Jesus had fulfilled any one of these messianic prophecies, the resurrection of the dead, the building of the final temple, Universal knowledge of God. We would know about it today. Any one of them. Just one. Isn't it odd that all the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled already are not exhaustive and exclusive if in reality he didn't fulfill any one of the ones that they claim forgetting about, setting aside the legitimacy of them. We're just going to ignore them for right now. Isn't it odd had Jesus not fulfilled any one of them or any of them, we wouldn't know about it today. There would be no way to know if he really wasn't born in Bethlehem. We'll just ignore the legitimacy of that. Let's say Jesus wasn't born of a virgin. Really, she wasn't the virgin. If Let's say he didn't live in Nazareth. Let's just say that. Was there any way we can know about it today? Is it just a coincidence all the things that he will fulfill in the second coming, they're all exhaustive and exclusive. Had Jesus filled any one of them, we would know about it today. Coincidence? Let's take a look at the study guide. On the top upper left hand side of the page, world peace. We have the, the two prophecies, just two examples. Isaiah chapter 2, which Bob mentioned earlier, and Isaiah chapter 11. The universal knowledge of God. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And no longer shall one teach his neighbor or shall one teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the smallest to their greatest, says the Lord. The resurrection of the dead. Daniel chapter 12. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The coming of Elijah the prophet. Now that's supposed to bring about the coming of the Messiah. And by the way, when Elijah the prophet comes, not only is he supposed to bring that about, but he's supposed to also, the messianic age that he ushers in also brings about family unity. Sometimes we see in many families there's discourse. Sometimes there, there's pain between brothers and children and so on that for years have not been healed yet. One of the things that the Messiah will do, and Elijah will usher this in, is restore the hearts of the children to their fathers. Let's take a look. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers. By the way, it's a very serious problem. How does Christianity deal with this? Remember, they didn't have Elijah the prophet, or did they? If I asked the Christian, where is your Elijah the prophet, what would they answer? They would say to you, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Elijah the prophet. Well, that's fine. There's only one little problem there. John the Baptist was actually asked this question in the first chapter of the book of John. People wanted to know, who are you? What are you here for? By what spirit? What brings you here? What do you represent? Who are you? They asked him, are you Elijah the prophet? And he said, well, no. He said, are you the prophet? Well, no. Let's take a look at the top gray box. And we're just looking at John 121. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Well, which one is it? Was he Elijah the prophet? Wasn't he Elijah the prophet? If he wasn't Elijah, where's your Elijah? One of the things that Elijah does through the Messianic age is a restoration of families. Very important. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Beautiful. Okay. The question is, well, how does that jive? How does that, is that congruent to what Jesus' message was? What does Jesus say about family unity? Is he here to restore families? Well, let's take a look. 
Take a look at the second great box, and we'll read Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 36. And Jesus is speaking here. Think not that I have come to send peace on earth. I came not to bring peace on earth, but a sword. For I am not come to set man at variance against his father, and the daughter against the mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Hmm. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Watch with me. Again, Jesus is speaking here. If you were looking at a red letter edition Bible, these words would be in red. If any man comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, and his sisters, yes, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. How does that measure with restoring children to fathers and fathers to children? How does that measure up? How do Christians deal with this, by the way? How do they respond? Very simple. It's, Jesus clearly is not telling people to hate their family. Certainly not. Oh, no, no, no. What Jesus is really saying is a much deeper message here. And that deeper message is, in contrast to your love for me, in contrast for the sacrifice you are willing to make for me, it would be as if, you hate your father as if you hate your mother. But it doesn't mean literally, this is how Christians would explain it, it does not mean literally. What's very interesting is that we can hear those words, and we may even be able to use Matthew to support it in some way. But the interesting thing is that when we look at the New Testament, one of the most important themes therein, it's interesting, and one of the reasons why Christianity is very appealing to many Christians, particularly Hebrew Christians, one of the most important themes there that runs throughout is from the first book of John, from John chapter 1. And he came to his own, but they received him not. It's a very important statement, and it's often not spoken about enough. The whole notion that a prophet is not without honor except from his own countrymen, it's a little complicated statement because there's a double negative there. But what Jesus is, if you look through Jesus' life, what we find is indeed that Jesus was rejected by his own, but accepted by the others, by those who shouldn't have normally accepted him. That's a very important theme. That's a rhythm that we find beating throughout the New Testament. I think we mentioned it a few weeks ago, the very first miracle in the book of John, the, the wedding in Cana, what happens? His mother says to him, look, there's the wedding. We have the bride and groom, but there's no wine. What does Jesus respond? He says to him, says to her, woman, what have I to do with you? Is that a nice answer? We find Jesus distancing himself from his mother. By the way, not just his mother, but his brethren as well. There are times in the New Testament Jesus is with his disciples. And someone says, you know, your brethren, your mother, they're standing outside, right? They're standing beyond you. And he said, and he didn't wish to speak to them. And he said, behold, you are my brethren. You are my mother. Very important statement. And of course, these statements are really salient to those people who personally feel that they've been rejected in life. And that's not unusual. Many people, school, tough, especially as an adolescent. You know, you, you, you weren't the most popular person. You felt that the people in your class, the people that should have loved you, your, your brother who's, you know, this overachiever is, you know, is going to Harvard, you know, with a scholarship and everything. And me, you know, everyone knows, you know, if I make it into, you know, to Albany, I'll be Rutgers, I'll make it, you know, I'll be all right, you know. And... People themselves feel rejected. One of the reasons why it's very, very difficult for someone to let go of Jesus, one of the reasons it's very hard for them to allow themselves to digest this new information, to incorporate evidence in order to make an, an, an informed decision about should I be a Christian or should I be a Jew, one of the reasons is they don't want to do to Jesus what people have done to them. And they understand Jesus. When they see Jesus, who was rejected by his own people, they say, oh my gosh, that was me. The only friends who really loved me, the only friends who were nice to me, was my Catholic friends. They were always respectful of me. But my Jewish friends, I was always the nerdy one. I, I couldn't even talk about it. It was too painful. And people say that over and over, and they feel it. And it's a pain they carry with them. And it takes years sometimes through adulthood to overcome the pain of adolescence. You know, they do studies where they ask people if you can be young again. People who are middle-aged, they ask them, if you can be young again, how young would you want to be? 
And I'll tell you now that no one is saying 13, 14, or 15. It's usually like, I think it's 22.7. Sort of don't want to go through adolescence again. Oh, no. Do you ever notice how when adults look at their pictures of themselves when they were teenagers, they always go, ooh, turn the page, woo, 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 woo. They don't want to look at it. Why? Because they were so dorky? Yes. But there's a second reason. <laughs> the second reason is that that image anchors in enormous pain. It's very difficult to look at your high school pictures in the yearbook because the image, it's not that you were not fully developed and that you were, you know, perhaps you had an acne problem. The image of seeing yourself in that photograph is so, it anchors in so much pain. Do you ever walk like through a, a bus terminal or walk into a store and you smell even a perfume, hear a song, and it's painful to hear the song? You're listening to the radio and suddenly a song comes on. And it's not that it's a bad song, but it suddenly anchors in this enormous it's enormously painful period of your time. You've got to turn the station. It reminds you. You smell. Smell, by the way, more than any other sense is intimately connected to memory. We smell. He's going, oh, God, yes. We smell. We smell a smell going somewhere, right? We're walking, and we smell a certain odor, a certain perfume, and it brings back enormous pain for us. And adolescence is a very difficult time. It's a time when we are searching for identity, who we are. And sometimes our self-esteem is not where it should be. We feel unloved, unwanted, undesirable. We feel filthy. We feel dirty. And we feel that none of our Jewish friends and none of the people that should have been there for us were really there for us when it counted. But the people on the outside who really shouldn't have been the ones, they were the one for us. And then they read the stories of Jesus, how Jesus was rejected by his own, how there was that distance, that cleavage between Jesus and his own family, Jesus and his own people of Galilee. Say, my gosh, I understand you, Jesus. I went through the same thing. This composite personality that's created for us is so powerful, it's so primal, it's very hard to let go. How can I be those people that rejected me? How can I now turn and reject Jesus? And if I believe in Jesus, I am then become part of the body of Christ. And just how ultimately Jesus was murdered by those people who rejected him, but he was victorious, he rose from the dead. By believing in him, I'm dead to the old, alive to new. I raise with him. You see? See how powerful it is? And you see the pain. That's why I urge you when you speak to a person, particularly a Jewish person, because for a Jewish person to make that step into Christianity is not an easy one. Most Hebrew Christians will tell you that it was a very painful experience. It was difficult to get it, you know, to swallow it, to get it down. After sure, it's almost like, you know, when people start smoking, right, that first puff, it's hard to get it down. It's like you're choking on it, but, you know, it's something you wanted to do. But after a while, it suddenly goes down and suddenly becomes pleasurable and suddenly it becomes addictive and you can't get rid of it. And that's why you have to approach people who are Hebrew Christians or who are contemplating conversion with great love and understanding. Because there's a lot going on there. There's a lot going on there. See, so when we look at New Testament statements, we don't want to just get caught up in the polemics. We want to really examine what's really happening here. How did this emerge? The ingathering of Israel, the next prophecy. And I'll bring thy seed from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back, bring my sons from far and my daughter from the ends of the earth. And the building of the third temple... I always encourage you, if you want to know about the Messiah and the Messianic Age from the biblical perspective, and you want to just spend a, a certain amount of time, read Ezekiel 37. It's all there, by the way. You can find all the signs of the Messiah just in Ezekiel 37. It's particularly the end of it. And I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My temple also shall be with them. Yes, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Very, very clear statement. Okay. I mean, when we naturally, when we're asked to become Christians by so many millions of people around the world, in this country and abroad, you know, we naturally have to say to ourselves, based on what? Why? Should I believe this? You have to remember, we have no outside physical evidence for Jesus. Nothing. There wasn't one contemporary historian that wrote even one jot or tittle about him. By the way, who is the most famous historian that was a contemporary of Jesus? 
No, Josephus was born in 37, so he wouldn't be a contemporary. He was born long after the alleged crucifixion. But Philo, very good. Philo of Alexandria, this is a Hellenistic Jew, who was a contemporary of Jesus. He was the kind of person, if one person said, one person sneezed, and the next person said Gesundheit, he would record who sneezed and who said Gesundheit. But there's not one word about him. And the silence of Josephus is deafening. The few words that we do find about Jesus, even Christian scholars is an interp agree that it's interpolation. The whole argument is how much of it is an interpolation. Remembering, if Jesus really, if, excuse me, if Josephus really believed what he said there about Josephus, isn't it odd that he spends 40 chapters on Herod the Great, but just a few verses on Jesus? That, that, does that really make much sense? Sometimes you have to even read the context of where it's coming from. The only thing we have is the New Testament. That's the only thing we have to rely on. New Testament, most of the books are written anonymously. You know, Protestants walk around, I said this yesterday, with their chest out. Sola Scripture, we only believe in the Bible, only the Word of God. <laughs> Those Catholics down the street. It's all tradition for them, isn't it? How foolish they are. They have more tradition than the Catholics do. And they certainly have accepted the traditions that the Catholics have made for them. Namely, the fact of who wrote the book of Matthew. Where does that come from? Matthew doesn't sign by Matthew or cordially. Matthew, no, that's not there anywhere. But they believe that based on Christian tradition. The question is, how reliable is the New Testament? Is it something that we could, we could invest our entire lives, and more important than our lives in this world, our eternity on? Who could not look at a grave? Who could not stand by the side of a, a gravesite and not be moved by that experience and say, you know, one day it's going to be me. I want to make sure this is the most important bet that I'm going to make. Where am I going to put my money? Where am I going to invest? And certainly we have a soul, a soul that craves for truth, and a soul that wishes to attach itself to the eternity. We want to attach ourselves properly. Can we depend on the New Testament? Is it a dependable document or not? How would we know that? Is it divinely inspired? Is it a reliable document even by secular standards? It's an important question. Well, the problem is that when we look at the New Testament, it says a lot more about the writers than it does about Jesus. Because when you look there, I've often challenged audiences to pick any event in the New Testament, any alleged miracle that Jesus did in the New Testament, and there's virtually no two books that agree on exactly what happened there. Let me give you an example. Here we have, on page 45, we have Stephen, the first Christian martyr, who's killed. But before he's killed, he stands up, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 6, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he begins to tell us so much about our Jewish history. And I think it's important that we should take a look. Let's watch on the left side. We're just going to examine three verses. Acts chapter 7, verse 14 through 16. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred. Okay, now this is the story of what happens is that Joseph is in Egypt, and Jacob is now going to come down to Egypt to be with his son. And how many people went down? All his kindred together, three score and fifteen souls. How much is three score and fifteen? Well, seventy-five. What's the problem with that? Well, it's not exactly seventy-five. Actually, it's seventy people, but not seventy-five. How do you know that? You look at the right side of the page, we simply look at what the Jewish scripture says. And the sons of Joseph, let's take a look at Genesis 46, 27. And the sons of Joseph, which were born to him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten. By the way, that comes out of a King James. That's not from our scroll. Exodus 1, 5. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And finally, Deuteronomy 10, 22. Thy fathers went down to Egypt with three score and Ten persons, seventy, seventy, and seventy. How could the Holy Spirit, how could the New Testament make a mistake, a simple mistake like that? Now, I'll tell you something funny. Remember I told you a long back, I said to you, that when we look at today's Septuagint, actually there are four primary manuscripts of the Septuagint. When we look at today's Septuagint, we are not looking at what the rabbis did. Remember I told you that? I told you that everything, first of all, the rabbis only in 256 BCE only translated the five books of Moses. And of course, I showed you Josephus, it's in your study guide, how Josephus mentions that in the Talmud, says it in Tractate Megillah 11b. But more than that, remember I told you that even the five books of Moses, when we open up today's Septuagint, when we order it from a Christian bookstore, right, because the Septuagint today does not come from the Jewish people, it's emerging from the church. You won't find a Septuagint put out by a Jewish 
When we look at even the five books of Moses, that's in today's Septuagint, that is not what the rabbis did at all. We can know that with certainty, by the way, because in the Talmud it tells us there are 15 specific types of translations that the rabbis did in order to make sure that people did not make error. We're not going to go through them, but if you take those 15 things that are in the Talmud, in Tractate Megillah, then go to the store, get yourself a Septuagint and compare them, you'll find something fascinating. That only one of them is still extant in today's Septuagint. Fourteen fifteenths is not there, and that tells us about how much of today's Septuagint, even of the five books of Moses, had anything to do with the Jewish people. But I'm going to show you something here marvelous, something marvelous, because you, you need to understand that the hand of the church was in the Septuagint. Just as the NIV alters the text, the Living Bible, the New American Standard, is willing to alter texts in the Jewish Scriptures in order to clarify the New Testament, in order to back up the New Testament, we find, when we find moreover statements in the Jewish Scriptures that are a nuisance to Christian theology, the NIV has no problem at all stepping in and simply altering the Jewish Scriptures accordingly. But the Septuagint writers and those people like Theodosian and Origen, these people too altered the Septuagint in order to protect the New Testament in Christian theology. And we see it right here. Many Christians would respond and say, well, you know why it says 75 in Acts chapter 7? Because they were going according to the Septuagint. And the Septuagint, if you look up these places in the Septuagint, if you look up Genesis 46, and you look up Exodus 1, you'll see the Septuagint says 75. What happened there? The church literally then went to the Septuagint and altered it in order to be congruent to Acts chapter 7. How do I know that? How can we prove that? There's a very simple way. There's a very simple way. And the way is that they were so sloppy when they altered the Jewish scriptures to cooperate with, with Acts, although you'll find in the Septuagint that Genesis 46 does say 75, and that Exodus 1.5 does say 75, open up a Septuagint and notice what they forgot. They were so sloppy in doing this. They were so hurried in covering their tracks, they forgot about Deuteronomy 10.22. Look up Deuteronomy 10.22 in the Septuagint, and it says 70. They forgot to change the last one. See what happens? Okay, let's move on. Verse 15, so Jacob went down to Egypt and died, he and our fathers. Move on, verse 16. Now, what happens? And were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money for, of the sons of Emmer, the father of Shechem. Okay. So they were carried, and I'm sure you know this, that the Ma'oris HaMachpelah, the place where the patriarchs and matriarchs were buried, you know that, right? That's in Shechem, right? Hebron, what do you think? It says here Shechem. Maybe Hebron is like this greater Hebron, and there's, I mean, they're not like the same city? I mean, not even close to each other? Oh, I see. Well, and of course, now you know the Hebron massacre and where it happened. We know it was in Hebron, it was not Shechem. How do you say Shechem when it was in Hebron? How do you make such a mistake? What does that tell us about the source of the New Testament? Divinely inspired? Human hand. How do you make that mistake? And was it indeed of the sons of Emmer that it was bought from? Well, not exactly. Look at the bottom of Genesis 50, verse 13. It was, it was Ephron the Chiti. But you need to understand something. Christians will tell you that, hey, when it comes to Jesus' genealogy, he's got it in spades. Now, that's where I've got you. You have to understand something, that, you know, the Messiah cannot come from any tribe. The Messiah has to come from a particular tribe. Does anyone know what tribe that's from? Judah, that's where we have you, not only from the tribe of Judah, but from the house of, from the house of David. Ah, but don't you know that Jesus has a genealogy that traces him directly back to King David, that shows clearly that he is authorized to, he is an excellent candidate, he is a legitimate candidate for the Messiahship? And we have those genealogies in the New Testament. But, you know, before we look at those genealogies, we have to wonder something, because there's a little problem. How do we know, how do we know what tribe you're from, by your father or by your mother? You know what tribe you're from by your father. How do you know that, by the way? Well, it says it many times in the book of Numbers, chapter 1. Why did the book of Numbers get that name? Because it begins with the military census. 
and the Jewish people were divided. Each tribe had a different role, and it had a different place in the military. And therefore, you had to know, in order to participate in this census, you had to know what tribe you were from. Now, you might have a mother from one tribe and a father from another tribe. How do you determine which is your tribe? Well, you look at Numbers, chapter 1, and it says there very clearly, L'mishpachosam, l'veisavosam. It's according to your family, according to your father's house. Here's the problem. If Jesus is indeed the Messiah, we have a problem. Because both according to Christianity and according to Judaism, Jesus did not have a human Jewish father with which to trace that genealogy back to King David. Think about this for a moment. According to Christianity, Jesus was born of a virgin. He only had a human mother. There was no human father. How then did he trace himself back to King David? There was no genealogy possible. He is an if you are telling me that, his, that he was born of a virgin, then you have another problem on the other side. You've shot yourself in the foot, because then he can't be the Messiah, because he doesn't have the human Jewish father with which to trace himself back to King David. By the way, it's both according to Judaism and Christianity, which says he did not have a human Jewish father. So according to both, he can't trace himself back to King David, therefore ineligible to be the Messiah. Christians have responded many things. Some of them said, oh, this is a doozy. They said, don't you know that Joseph adopted him? You ever hear that one? Joseph adopted him. I always want to ask the question, who gave him up for adoption? I mean, these are questions... I mean, these are questions that certainly need to be answered. Christians have said, well, he doesn't fulfill it through the father. He really fulfills it through his mother. You see, his mother, Mary, was from the house of David. The only problem is that Mary's genealogy is worthless when it comes to knowing what tribe you're from. It has no relevance whatsoever, none at all. As a matter of fact, we see in the New Testament that there are two genealogies of Jesus given. One of them is in the book of Matthew, and the other one is in the book of Luke. Turn the page, please. The one that's in the book of Matthew will find in Matthew chapter 1, and the one that's in the book of Luke is in Luke chapter 3. By the way, if you look at the right side of the page and you see the first gray box, you see it says there, patrilinear descent for tribe identification on the right side. That's the verse that I just looked at the earlier with you, showing you very clearly that it's according to your father's house that you know what tribe you're from. Let's take a look at this page, which might appear at first glance a little scary, but it won't in just a moment. Let's take a look at these two strips. Now, the two columns, you notice there are three columns on the left side. The first one says First Chronicles. And for just a moment, we're not going to look at that. The next one, the middle column going down, is the one from the book of Matthew. What I simply did was, I opened up a Christian Bible, opened up a Christian Bible, and what I did was I simply copied down all the names in Matthew's genealogy. And then I turned a few pages to Luke chapter 3, and then I simply recorded down, as Luke gives us, Jesus' genealogy. Okay? Now, there are some things that immediately strike us, and you should know that Christians, according to Christian tradition, according to Christian tradition, although all Catholics and Protestants believe this, that Luke's genealogy is the genealogy of Mary, and Matthew's genealogy is the genealogy of, through Joseph, through the Father. Okay? So, according to Christian tradition, Matthew's genealogy is really the genealogy of Joseph, Jesus through Joseph. According to Christian tradition, Luke's genealogy is Jesus' genealogy through the mother, through Mary. By the way, why is it so important to Christian tradition and to the church fathers that we believe that Luke's genealogy, although it says it nowhere, that this is the genealogy of the mother? Well, there are a number of reasons for it. One reason is, if you simply look at the two genealogies and look at the bottom of them, and I would simply turn your eyes to Matthew's genealogy, I gave you a number next to each name, would be number 39, who is Joseph's father? According to Matthew's genealogy, who is Joseph's father? Jacob. Now, Luke is writing in an entirely different place. He didn't have a telephone to call up Matthew and say, by the way, who did you write for Joseph's father? He couldn't do that. So, if you look at Luke's genealogy, who's number 54? Haley. It's an entirely different person. Well, that's one reason why you've got to say they're different people. But there's a second and more important reason, that is we want to try to get Mary in one of these genealogies because we can't trace it through Joseph, we clearly can't trace it through God, we obviously have to trace it through the mother. So what we'll point to is say that this genealogy of Luke, that's the physical genealogy after the flesh for Jesus. By the way, Luke never, ever says anywhere that Mary was from the house of David. 
only Joseph, and I want you to write down this verse, and that's Luke chapter 1, verse 27. Luke chapter 1, verse 27, where Luke specifically says, it is Joseph that is from the house of David. Never do we find Mary from the house of David. It's simply not there. But it needs to be there. Again, Christian tradition. Well, we can go a little further. Now, what I'd like you to know is that the very first verse of the New Testament, how does it go? It says, this is the generations of Jesus Christ. Okay? This is the genealogy of Jesus. The very first verse in the New Testament. Next time you're in Howard Johnson's, you can look it up. Now, what we do is, we then have all this whole series of names right down the center. I want you to follow with me very carefully. After, after Matthew finishes the entire genealogy, there's a verse 17. After the 16 verses of genealogy, there's a verse 17. After Matthew completes the whole genealogy, we have now verse 17. Let's take a look at it because Matthew is going to tell us something very special. This is not just a whole jumble bumble of names. Oh no! There's a symmetry here. There's something very spiritual here. There's something very special about this genealogy. I'd like you to follow along with me. On the bottom of the center column, I have Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. This is the verse immediately after the genealogy. Watch what Matthew tells us. It's fantastic. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. Okay, and take a look at that. We'll just look at that for a moment. You see there, Abraham is number 1. David is number 14, right? So far, so good. That's good. After the semicolon, let's move on. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon, okay, until the Babylonian exile, are 14 generations. Well, that's kind of all right, too. If you take a look from David, that's number 14. We move down to number 28. Okay, that's where basically where we have number 29. That's where we have the end. We have the Babylonian exile. Well, that's kind of okay, too. And then from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ, are 14 generations. Don't you see? 14, 14, 14. This is not an ordinary genealogy, my friends. Oh no, there's something very special here. From Abraham to David, 14, is that an accident? From David until the carrying away into Babylon, the Babylonian exile, 14 generations. From the Babylonian exile into Christ, 14, 14, 14. That's special. By the way, why is 14 so important to Matthew? Why is the number 14? And sometimes you need the Talmud to understand the New Testament. Why is the, the number 14 has an enormous meaning to the Jewish people in numerology. The number 14 has enormous value to the Jewish people. It has a special message. What message is attached to the number 14? Does anyone know? Kingship. That's a malchus. Kingship. The number 14 is a number that distinguishes kingship, that underscores kingship. Even if we take King David, not only do we find the distance from Abraham to David 14, but if you even take King David's name, remember, in the Hebrew language, every letter has a number attached to it. Every no letter is not just a letter, a consonant, but it, it is also a, has a numerical value. Let's take David's name. How do you spell David? Dalid, Vav, Dalid. How much is Dalid equal? Four. How much is Vav equal? Six. How much is Dalit equal? How much is four? Six and four? Oh, I can feel the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Fourteen. Four. Now we have a very special message here. Matthew needed to tell us this. That this symmetry, that the Babylonian exile into Christ, 14, just the same distance as from, Dave, from Abraham to David, and from David until the Babylonian exile, 14 as well. This is very special. Symmetry, kingship. Ah, now we understand. There's only one little problem. How did Matthew get his 14, 14, and 13, really? There's only 14 times 3 is how much? 42. All right, we can't be too technical. We'll let that one slide. Okay, 41, 2. It's only one off. You know, it's not a big deal. Don't get stumpy so technical. How did he get that 14 and 14? Remember I told you a moment ago that I had Chronicles, First Chronicles on the left side? What we call that is our control group. Why is that called our control group? Very simple. The genealogy of Matthew 
also has a parallel genealogy in the Jewish scriptures, in what Christians call the Old Testament. You see the column on the left side that we had ignored up to this point? That comes from the book of Chronicles. That is a genealogy of Abraham through David and King David's children. Not all of them, by the way, are kings, but a great segment are kings. Here we have, on the left side, a genealogy. Now, this is what's important. This genealogy, both according to Christianity and Judaism, has to be the Word of God, has to be true. This one can't be lying. First Chronicles is the Old Testament, am I right? Therefore, it has to be true. This cannot be lying. This must be the Word of God. First Chronicles, the left side, is our control group. This has to be true. Remember, Judaism can be true, yet Christianity can be false. Christianity can't be true and Judaism is false. That's impossible. So, right, the, old, the Jewish scriptures can be the Word of God, and the New Testament might not. But the New Testament can't be the Word of God with the Old Testament not being it. Remember that. First Chronicles, very clearly, has to be the Word of God. Well, what exactly did Matthew do to get his 14, 14, 14? Oh, he desperately wanted those numbers. It was very simple. If you take a look at the control group, uh, First Chronicles on the left side, he just skips a few genes. You notice there are gray boxes? Now, that wasn't word perfect in going to lunch. No, no, not at all. That was... The gray box tells you that there's some people missing there. Who is missing? Well, number 20, a football team. Number 21, 22, and 23, the First Chronicles. Ahazia, Amazia, Azaria. These three people exist. Matthew couldn't have them there because you bust up his middle 14. They have to go. No problem at all. You just erase them, and they're not there anymore. According to Matthew's genealogy, Uzziah had a father whose name is Yehoram. But in reality, when we see Azariah in First Chronicles, his father is not a Yehoram, but he's a Mazia. Yehoram is his great-grandfather. How do you play games with the Bible? How do you simply take names and remove them and place them and change things and then misrepresent the Bible? How do you do that? If you're uncomfortable, if you want to get, does the ends really always justify the means? Is it really true that whether in pretense or in truth the gospel is preached, does that really make sense? How do you change the word of God? How do you simply erase the and pray to God that no one notices it? You know, it's no wonder, of course, when we think about the Catholic Church for nearly a thousand years had a whole list of books that were considered dangerous to the faith for people to read, and the number one book on that list was considered the, the Bible. Oh no, that's a little dangerous. Maybe you should stay away from that. Well, now we're beginning to understand. How do you remove names to get your 14, 14, and 14? Some Christians have told me, look, he was eliminating the evil people. <laughs> now, first of all, this, I mean, you have there a fellow like Menashe, who was number 25, quarterback now. Number 25, Menashe, right? Menashe was a very evil king. But is a genealogy any place to play favorites? Some Christians have said, but it's true in the Bible that sometimes someone may be called someone, someone with their, really their grandson or great-grandson. That's true, but then don't tell me 14, 14, and 14. When you're counting 14, 14, and 14, don't tell me that you're removing people. You can't do that. Follow? Well, at this point, Luke's genealogy is starting to smell a little good. Let's see what Luke has to say. Now, Luke's genealogy, well, he doesn't do those things, but there's another problem with Luke's genealogy, which we didn't mention earlier. What's the problem with Luke's genealogy? The problem is, you remember I told you a moment ago, you remember, remember I mentioned to you just a little earlier that in order to be the Messiah, in order to be a king in Israel, including the Messiah who was the final king in Israel, you had to come not only from the tribe of Judah, but also from the house of David. Remember I mentioned that? But did I tell you the whole story? There was actually one more piece of information. King David had a number of children. Isn't it odd that no king can come from any one of his children? Actually, the kings of Israel can only come from one of his children. Do you know which one? King Solomon. That means although King David had numerous children, the Messiah and the kings of Israel can only come through King Solomon. How do you know that? Question, how do you know that? Right? The Bible is extremely clear on this subject. When God was telling King David that there was going to be a covenant between him and King David, and we saw in the lecture called the Trinity how important that, king, that covenant was, that promise was, and to what extent God was willing to go to protect that covenant, he said to him that I'm going to make a covenant with you that through you, 
will be all the kings of the Jewish people. It'll come from you. But specifically, not from any one of your children, it will specifically come from the one who will build this house in my name. Oh yes, some of your children, they may sin. They may turn away from God. And by the way, many did. But although I will smite them with the rod of men, I will never take away the kingship from your children as I did with King Saul, your predecessor. Only from the one who builds the house in my name, specifically King Solomon. And by the way, all of them did. Let's take a look now at the middle gray box. Okay? The Davidic covenant passes exclusively through King Solomon. I, God, which is God, will set up your seat after you that shall proceed out of your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish a throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him for a father, and he shall be to me for a son. If he commits iniquity, I will chase him with the rod of men and with the stripes of children of men, for my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. So we have this very clear statement. I've given you some other sources where you can look up on your own on the bottom. Very clear that now we know something more, more information that actually brings us now to the genealogy that's important. That the Messiah, all the kings of the Jewish people, including, of course, and finally the Messiah, have not only to come from King David, but only from one of King David's children, and that is King Solomon. Well, if you look at Matthew's genealogy, Matthew looks okay there. If you look at number 15 in Matthew's genealogy, he's got that one right, King Solomon. That one's okay. There's only one problem. Let's take a look at number 15 in Luke's gene genealogy. There's a problem there. Nathan, wrong son. And therefore, Luke's genealogy is absolutely worthless if we want to know who the Messiah is, because it's simply going through the wrong son. If you want to be the Messiah, if you want to be the king in Israel, you simply have got to come through King Solomon. Now, at this point, Matthew's genealogy is starting to smell like tulips, because at least Matthew has the right person. Matthew is going through King Solomon. But that's where we run into another problem. Do you remember I told you a moment ago, I mentioned earlier to you, that you had to come from King David, and you also had to come from King Solomon. Sorry to do this to you, but there's more. Oh, yes. You see, down the line, number of generations down from King Solomon, there was one particular king that was so evil, he was actually referred to by historians as the Jewish Caligula, to just give you some sense of where he was spiritually. His name was Jeconia. Actually, Jeremiah shortened his name to Conia, moving in the central part of it. Now, this person, Jeconia, had it right. He had the right genealogy. He came directly through Solomon, David, through the tribe of Judah. No problem there. Except the Bible is very clear about something, and that is there was a curse. Because Jeconia was so evil and so rotten, the prophet Jeremiah said that out of you, none of your children will ever sit on the throne of David forever. The curse against Jeconia was that none of your children can ever, ever sit on the throne of David again. And by the way, they never did. Who was the next, who was the next king after Jeconia? And by the way, there's Jeconia on the list. Take a look at him, he's number 28. If indeed Matthew's genealogy, if indeed Matthew's genealogy is really a genealogy of Jesus, which Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 says, if we can rely on that, not only does that genealogy not prove that Jesus is the Messiah, but that if that genealogy is indeed the genealogy of Jesus, not only is Jesus not eligible the Messiah, he cannot possibly be the Messiah because he comes from that cursed genealogy. Let's take a look just for one moment at the verse, and it comes from Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30, the third box on the right side. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man Jeconia, childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Ladies and gentlemen, if Matthew's genealogy is indeed the genealogy of Jesus, it not only does not prove that Jesus is the Messiah, it not only doesn't point to Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus is ineligible to be Messiah because he comes from a cursed lineage. And that's why we see. Who is Jeconia's son? Look at it. What's his name? Sheltiel. Sheltiel should have been the next king. Oh no, Shel there was a curse. It can't be. So Sheltiel never becomes king. 
Who is the next king after Jeconia? Zedekiah. You have to look at the upper part in First Chronicles. That was his uncle. It then had to go to his father's brother. It could not possibly anymore go to him, go to his son, as all the rest had. Look at the pattern. Up until we come to Jeconia, father, son, father, son, father, son. Bang, Jeconia the curse. He has a son. Oh, yes, eligible. But no, he can't sit on the throne. And the next person is, we find, is, is Zedekiah. Who is he? Zedekiah. He's his uncle. It actually has to move away from any one of his children. And indeed, we see that Jeconia had children, grandchildren that were righteous, like Zerubbabel. And God said in Haggai that Zerubbabel was a righteous man, and God even put a signet ring on him and said that I'm giving you authority, but Zerubbabel can never become king. He therefore can only become governor. We see the curse so clearly there. Not just in Jeconi, but even when we see the return to the second temple, Zerubbabel cannot become king. Oh yes, he's given authority, but the beauty of it is Haggai proves clearly that the curse still remained because Zerubbabel was someone who loved God. Oh no, I'm sorry, Zerubbabel, you'll be a governor, you can't be king. We have a curse from Jeremiah 22. Now, the question becomes, of course, how do Christians answer that point? How do they respond? You should know that there are three primary responses that Christians, that the church has responded with. There are three ways that the church has responded to this incredible problem. Of course, you realize that, you know, whatever answer you can give them, why have Matthew's genealogy to give with? No matter what answer you give, what's the purpose of gene Matthew's genealogy? Let's give the first answer. The first answer is the answer that Christian scholars use who are from the evangelical camp. And I want to take the most well-known scholars from the evangelical camp and look at how they deal with this problem. And it's a serious one with that. The first way that goes is like this. Aha! That's why you need the virgin birth, don't you see? Ha <laughs> ha! You missed it! That's why you need a virgin birth. You see, if Jesus really was physically born of Joseph, that's the reason why he needed to begin with. If Jesus really was sired by Joseph, if he was the physical son of Joseph, then he would be ineligible to be the Messiah. Why? Because he comes from Jeconia. That's why you need the virgin birth, and therefore he's not under that curse. Huh? Now, I know that some of you might have a little trouble with that. You say, Come, come now, Rabbi Singer, aren't you just pushing this a little bit? Actually, I'm not, and I thought you wouldn't believe me, so instead of using word perfect, I thought I'd Xerox it right out. Do you ever hear, of, those of you who are dabbled in Christian theology, study this, you ever, he's probably, you've probably never heard of him, not really very well known, Josh McDowell? Okay, Josh McDowell, of course, is the most, it could be said that he is the most well-known apologist for the church. Well, let's see how Josh McDowell handles this. Now, he has many books, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. He has another book, a very well-known book, called A Ready Defense. Well, I thought, let's take a look at Josh McDowell and see how he handles this problem. And let's take a look at page 47, the next page. We're going to have to turn the book horizontally this time. It's on the left side, and I've Xeroxed the page out for you. It's page 188. You see in the center, in bold words, a necessary fact of history. Okay, Josh McDowell is now going to explain why the virgin birth was a necessary fact of history, okay? Let's look at the first sentence there. There are several reasons the virgin birth was a necessity. Stop, okay? You understand that first sentence? He is now going to give us a number of reasons why the virgin birth was an essential element in Christology. Why is that? Now, there are a number of reasons. We're interested in the fourth reason. That's the one that concerns us right now. Let's go to the fourth paragraph, the one that begins with the word moreover. That's the one we're interested. Follow along with me, if you would. Moreover, if Jesus had been sired by Joseph, he would not have been able to claim the legal rights to the throne of David. According to the prophecy of Jeremiah 22, verse 28 through 30, there could be no king in Israel who was the descent of King Jeconia, and Matthew 1, verse 12, relates that Joseph was from the line of Jeconia. Jesus would have been from the cursed lineage. This is Josh McDowell. How about the Ryrie Study Bible? Again, mainstream commentary, evangelical, Trinitarian camp. These are not liberal Christians speaking here. It's on the right side. This is the first page of the New Testament in the Ryrie Study Bible. This happens to be the NIV version. Take a look at the bottom. And what we're interested in is on the bottom right-hand side, in the small world, these are, this is the annotation of the Ryrie Study Bible. 
Here we go. It's on Matthew chapter 1, verse 11. It's the commentary on Jeconia. Please do follow along with me. Jeconia, or Jehoiachin, king of Judah, who was taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar in 597 B.C. In the Hebrew, Jeremiah contracted Jeconia to Konia. A curse was pronounced on Konia that none of his descendants would prosper sitting on the throne of David. Had our Lord been the natural son of Joseph, Joseph, he could not have been successful on the throne of David because of this curse. But since he came through Mary's lineage, he was not affected by this curse. Why have Matthew's genealogy? Take a look at the first verse in the New Testament. That's something that's very, very easy to remember. First verse in the New Testament, sometimes people say, Rabbi, I have a lot of trouble remembering verses. Someone said that to me earlier this evening. Well, it, it's very easy to remember the first verse of the New Testament. This is how it all begins. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. If this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Jesus is ineligible to be the Messiah. What is Matthew's genealogy doing for us? Now, we've, we've now seen how modern evangelical scholars deal with this problem. There, but there are two other people that deal with this problem differently. And that is Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke, what do they do? They each have to contend with this serious problem as well. And they do. Now, Luke is the physician. He's very careful. He's the one, by the way, when we see mistakes in the New Testament, it's most likely going to be Matthew. First of all, he was Jewish. Now, what I mean by that was because he came from a Jewish background, but a, a, an assimilated Jewish background, sometimes a little information is dangerous. So Matthew is always the one who's blowing it, and Luke is the one who's smart enough to know what he doesn't know, and he checks it out. So when we have Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which tells us the Messiah is going to come lowly into Jerusalem on a donkey, the foal of an ass, well, Matthew reads it in his, you know, he had a basically, I guess, a Hebrew school knowledge of Hebrew, and he goes, okay, that means Jesus is coming in on two animals. And he just has the whole story of Jesus coming to Jerusalem sitting on two animals. And of course, Luke was smart enough to check out the Hebrew, and the second part was simply a description of the first. It's one animal. And John, of course, followed suit. So what you have is, what you have is Matthew, you have Jesus coming in on two animals, and the rest of the Gospels, you have Jesus coming in on one animal, which is it? Now, Luke was much more careful. Again, Luke had to cover himself. He did things very carefully. He didn't want to do things in a sloppy way. He had to get, a ri he had to get rid of Jaconia. Jaconia is a liability, and he does it well. Remember, who was Jaconia's son? Sheltiel. Very good. Let's take a look at Luke's genealogy, because we have Sheltiel there. He's number 35. You know who Sheltiel's father is? Well, it depends. If you look at First Chronicles, we know Shaltiel's father was Jeconia, verse 17 of chapter 1. But he's smart to say, this guy's got to go. He is a liability. No problem. We'll just replace him with another guy named Nair. Who's Nair? I don't know. But he's Nair. He's Nair. He's close. He's far. He's Nair. What is this? Now, but Luke is careful. Jeconia is out. You are a liability problem. You can't stay. You've got to go. Matthew again. Again, someone with a very limited knowledge of Judaism, someone who doesn't check things out carefully because he has a little knowledge. What does Matthew do? He says, Jeconia has got to go. But how do you say really Jeconia in Hebrew? Yechonia, or Yehoyachin. Jeconia really is Yehoyachin. And he had to go. Yehoyachin had to be removed. There's only one problem. You know what Yehoyachin's father's name is? Anyone want to say it? Yehoyachim. You notice the difference? It's virtually identical. What does Matthew do? He blows it. He takes out the wrong guy. He takes out the father instead of the son. Take a look what Matthew does. You see Josiah? Who's Josiah's son? He's not there. That's Yehoyachim. That's the guy who's not cursed. He leaves him the guy who's cursed, and he takes out the guy who's not cursed. He takes out the wrong person. So, Gesund, that's why now everything will fall into place. That's why Matthew's genealogy has only 41 names, not 42. Originally, he had the three people out on top. But think about it. Why did he take out Jaconia? That was stupid. Think about it. He had 42. If he took out the three, if he was so careful, he wanted to count the 42, he should have just left well enough alone, take out the three on the top, and leave that other gray one there. The guy's between 27 and 28. Oh, no, he has to go. But he takes out the wrong guy. That's why you have 41 generations. Because there's one missing, but he took out the wrong person. Okay? So we have three basic Christian responses. We have the evangelical response, we have Luke's response, and we have Matthew's response. Therefore, no question, of course, that you know, there are three pastoral epistles. You know what a pastoral epistle is? 
Paul is writing 13 epistles, 13 letters, three of them, and that's First and Second Timothy, and also the book of Titus. Those three books are called pastoral epistles. Why did they have that name? Does anyone know? They have that name because these books were written as instructions for the church. They were written to teach pastors, to teach church leaders, how to care for the church. What to do, what to do in case of a crisis. How do you handle different situations? Well, in 1 Timothy, where Paul begins to tell him what you should do and what you shouldn't do, Paul gives him some advice, and I would want to say to you that I think it's very good advice. Paul says to him, look, don't, one thing don't do, when you want to talk about proving Jesus, the one thing you never want to get involved in is genealogies. That's just going to, that's just going to create questions in faith, and you don't want to do that. Stay away from genealogies. They don't help faith. They just, they just take away from it. Take a look at the bottom of page 46, 1 Timothy 1, 4. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying. Good advice. Don't get involved in genealogies. That's just going to get you into problems. Stay away from that. That's good pastoral advice. Let's continue. 